Hello and welcome back to Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion. This week we welcome NASA legend Homer Hickam to the show. The inspiration for the film October Sky talks about growing up in a West Virginia coal mining town, training astronauts, and teaching David Letterman how to scuba dive. But first, we look in on an extreme exoplanet where iron rains down from the sky. We join NASA as they ready to deflect an asteroid for the very first time. And we're going to join a Russian film crew which recently arrived at the International Space Station preparing to shoot the first movie in space. Iron Rain on the exoplanet WASP-76b makes this a strange world. And a new study opens up mysteries of this igneous planet 640 light years from Earth. This Jupiter-like world orbits incredibly close to its parent star, heating the atmosphere on the sunlit side of the planet to such an extent that iron actually vaporizes. Now, when winds blow this vapor to the cooler side of the world, the metal falls as iron rain. Somebody cue Bob Dylan. DART, a planetary defense test uh, designed by NASA, aims to protect Earth from asteroids and comets. Now, dinosaurs ruled Earth for 165 million years, but somehow failing to develop a space program, they were wiped out by a massive asteroid 66 million years ago. Today, asteroids or comets coming from space could wipe out a city, a nation, or even disrupt human civilization worldwide. The DART mission will be the first to test a kinetic impactor. This plan aims, quite literally, to strike an incoming asteroid with a spacecraft in an effort to change its course to one which, hopefully, misses Earth. Now, DART is scheduled to launch this November on its mission to impact Didymos B. Uh, allowing researchers to test the technique on a harmless asteroid. On Tuesday, the 5th of October, the Russian space agency Roscosmos launched a professional actor to the International Space Station. The upcoming film, Challenge, stars Yulia Perslin a 37-year-old actress as a surgeon sent to the ISS to save an ailing cosmonaut. The landing of the craft will also be recorded and is expected to be seen in the final version of the film. Challenge is the first feature-length motion picture shot in space. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. Next up, we talk with Homer Hickam, who will tell us about his life as a boy growing up in a coal mining town, learning rocket science, and we're going to talk about his new book, Don't Blow Yourself Up. This week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Homer Hickam. He is the author of Rocket Boys, 
a book that was later made into one of my favorite movies, October Sky. And he's here to talk to him to us about his newest book, uh, Don't Blow Yourself Up. Welcome to the show, Homer. <laughs> well, thank you, James. I always like to put a caveat in about now when I'm introduced that way to say, for all you fans of October Sky, the movie, I apologize for not actually being Jake Gyllenhaal. So, uh, and I know that, that when Jake goes around, he apologizes for not being me. So, you know, it's, we do that. We do that around the world. <laughs> oh, that's great. So i just like you to take us back, if you will, to that October night in 1957 when you first saw Sputnik headed over, over your head. What was, what was going through your mind? Yeah, well, um, you know, I was living in this little coal town, Colwood, West Virginia. Uh, it was a pure mining town, a pure company town. The company owned everything, owned every house, every tree, every road, every fence, every store, even owned a church. Every squirrel. Every, every squirrel. Well, yeah, you know, my mom owned a squirrel, so it lived in the house. Its name was Chipper. So Chipper was a company squirrel, I guess. And <laughs> oh, I love Chipper because Chipper hated my brother. He used to, my brother goes to sleep on the couch and I just watched Chipper sneak over and I knew that Chipper was going to go bite him. And it's like, should I wake my brother up? Nah, I'll let Chipper bite him. Yeah, you know, yeah. so, uh, and, then, and then, and then my, my brother would chase the squirrel through the house and Chipper would head for my mom and run up, run up on her shoulder. And it's like, oh, there's my little boy, Chipper, you know, and then my brother couldn't do anything about it. I love that. But anyway, that was um, uh, e every adult male in Colwood um, uh, had to work for the company. So they were, you know, mostly underground coal miners. Um, every adult woman was required to uh, uh, be married or uh, related uh, to one of the coal miners. Uh, so, um, and, and even the preacher was a company man, by the way. And uh, since the company owned the church, and every three years we got a new religion because the preacher was on a three-year contract. Uh, so, um, and we got the low bid religion, you know, whatever it was. Uh, uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes we were. I mean, we were living good when we were Methodists, but then overnight we'd become Southern Baptists. And that, <laughs> you know, that was kind of tough. Um, but anyway, so that was kind of town it was. It was a small little town. There was about 1,500 people that lived there. Uh, but we had good, we had good teachers. Uh, the coal company actually went out and uh, gave a little extra money for, to bring in good teachers. And um, the sense was that the coal was probably going to be running out. And even though our fathers and our grandfathers and our great grandfathers had made money as coal miners, the, most of the people in the town thought, well, we better educate our kids and get them out of, out of there. So our schools were pretty good. And um, so um, I, and I'd read a lot of science fiction uh, growing up, uh, Heinlein and Isaac Asimov. It's kind of the golden age of science fiction back in the 1950s. And most of us kids uh, across the country uh, were big sci-fi fans even back then. And so um, but it, we were in the middle of the Cold War. The Russians were our enemies. They had uh, nuclear weapons that they were going to uh, use on us or we were going to use it on them. In other words, uh, the, the, it looked like that somewhere along the line we're going to get in a hot war with uh, with nuclear weapons flying. So that's enough to scare a lot of people. But um, and then uh, all of a sudden in October of 1957, the, the Russians just it seemed like out of the blue launched Sputnik. Now, for those of us who were paying attention, it was actually the international geophysical year that year, and the Russians had already announced to everybody that they were going to launch a, an Earth satellite, and the Americans had said, well, 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 we are too, you know, and so um, it shouldn't have been a big surprise, but it was to most people when the Russians beat the United States to put an Earth satellite in orbit. But for those of us who read all the science fiction, it was like, hey, this is kind of cool, you know, um, it's like, uh, we didn't really expect this to happen in our lifetime, that there was, you know, something in orbit and certainly not people, but, uh, maybe a thousand years from now. Um, and then um, I, I read in the paper, the local paper, that um, Sputnik was going to fly actually over MacDow County where Colwood was. And I thought, you know, that's really cool. Um, and uh, it was like everybody was talking about this and was afraid of it or, you know, you know in some way, everybody in the country and the world were talking about Sputnik. 
So it's going to fly over Colwood. I mean, how can I miss this? All so right, I told my, right, right. I told, yeah. So I told my mom I was going to watch Sputnik uh, fly over in the backyard because it was dark back there. Uh, when he lights and um, she told the neighbor lady who told the neighbor lady who told the neighbor lady all down the line there that that Sonny as I was called back then was going to watch Sputnik fly over and somehow that all got garbled to 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 um, you could only see it from our backyard I think <laughs> so uh, <laughs> so uh, so come the time as it was it was it gotten dark we, we had a good part of Colwood in our backyard and my dad who is a mine superintendent walked out and said and um, LC, you know, why are all these people in our backyard? And uh, she said, well, they come to they come to help uh, Sonny watch Sputnik fly over Homer. Uh, uh, my dad was a Homer, Homer Sr. And, and he said, well, President Eisenhower would never allow anything Russian to fly over MacDowell County. And he just he wouldn't look. He just went up to the mine or something. But Sputnik, uh, President Eisenhower was not in charge of the laws of physics, um, which surprised I'm certainly surprised my dad. Uh, so um, Sputnik did show up at the appointed moment, and it was the most amazing thing that I had ever seen. I just, it's like, again, it was just th that thing that everybody was talking about. And the, again, it was uh, MacDowell County still, it's the very southern part of, of MacDowell County, is known for its dark skies. There, there is so little uh, ambient light uh, there. And you've also got these really tall mountains. So if there's, you know, like the moon, it takes a long time for the moon to rise up above these tall mountains that are really close together. So we had extremely dark sky and, uh, and beautiful star fields there. And uh, somebody ought to put a dark sky telescope in there someday. Uh, but anyway, the way our valley was situated, uh, Sputnik came along and just split that sky. So we had a good view of Sputnik mm. for a long time. And uh, very, very bright. And uh, I was just absolutely uh, astonished by it, amazed. And I thought to myself right at that moment, I'd like to be I'd like to be part of that. And of course, this is where I decided I was going to build a rocket, which became kind of famous with the, my book, Rocket Boys, and then the movie October Sky. And then my mom's admin, admonition to me all the time as I was going out the door hauling one of our rockets um it was don't blow yourself up and uh and then then when we came close to doing that and then later on through my life it was didn't i tell you not to blow yourself up? <laughs> yeah. so so that 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 was an obvious title for this um uh, for this uh, new memoir that i've written and that takes place after the rocket boys era and for 40 years afterwards so that's, that's what that's all about so, you know, you faced so many challenges, you know, not only, you know, coming from Colwood, but, you know, just having to learn all this, all this engineering and all this physics. And, you know, you must have had some really discouraging days. And well, we did. How, how did you get past that? Well, but, you know, I, I, I was more, honestly, I was really inclined, and, it, and this happened when I was 14 years old. So I... Uh, high school there in Colwood was actually two mountains away. Everything in West Virginia is number of mountains away. <laughs> you know, two mountains away uh, was Big Creek High School, which was a con consolidated high school for that part of the county. And uh, so, uh, so I was in the tenth grade, and our I was really more inclined to to write and to read. I just loved English, you know, no problem with that. I think if Sputnik hadn't happened, I'd probably become a English professor at some Midwestern university. Not that there was anything wrong with that, but I was really more inclined in that direction. But it was because of all the science fiction that I had read that I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, learn how to build a rocket. And uh, our highest, uh, uh, our math in high school was trigonometry. And we had plane geometry, solid geometry, and trigonometry. Uh, um, and then uh, we'd had algebra in, as, as freshmen in ninth grade but no calculus or differential equations or anything like that. So that was, I mean, we had good physics teacher, uh, Miss Riley, Frida Riley was our physics teacher, good biology teacher. So we had, we had a, a good grasp of those sciences, but uh, nothing about how to build a rocket or the physics involved with that or the engineering involved with that. So uh, ultimately um, Miss Riley, uh, our, our, uh, our teacher there took up for us. She liked, 
the idea of the Rocket Boys and um, and got us uh, calculus classes. But she also got us a book called Principles of Guided Missile Design. And I later saw that same book in the PhD program for for, for rocket scientists. It really it required a, a thorough knowledge of calculus and differential equations right, just right. in the first page. <laughs> I mean, it's just one um, uh, set of, uh, of, of uh, mathematical calculations from one end to the other with just a little bit of explanation in between. Uh, but th we did have a genius on our team, Quentin Wilson, who was an and absolute of genius. In the movie. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he was in the movie. He taught himself yeah. calculus. He already knew calculus, but mm -hmm. and then he was able to help me uh get through it as well, get through all the calculations and so on. So, yeah, we were we were pretty pretty sophisticated for um, for West Virginia boys. And uh, and then Miss Riley wanted us to go to the science fairs, which we did, and uh, went off and uh, won some medals uh, doing that for her, primarily. Uh, I didn't care anything about it. And um, the, the movie says that we all got scholarships. We didn't get any scholarships. They didn't used to do that very much. It's like, I gave you a medal. Do, what else do you <laughs> I, I shook your hand. Gave you a piece of paper. That's right. Get back yeah, to the yeah, coal mine, kid. Yeah, go back. Yeah, what, what's wrong with you? <laughs> so um, I was fortunate in, uh, and I write about this in the new book about. Uh, I wanted to go to the Air Force Academy because I wanted, like, I always, I wanted this space. You know, I wanted to do that, and um, and I thought that would be the place to go. It turned out that um, my. Um, so I asked Quentin, of course, how do I get in an Air Force Academy, Quentin? And Quentin says, well, you, you have to get your congressman to nominate you. And I went, oh, okay. So I went to my dad and I said, Dad, who's, my, who's our congressman? And she, he said, why do you want to know? And I said, well, I, I, I want to get nominated to the Air Force Academy. And he said, well, it doesn't matter because he's a Democrat and all Democrats are thieves. So we're not, you're not writing to him. But who you should write is Vice President Richard Nixon. <laughs> So I wrote Vice President Richard Nixon for a nomination to the Air Force Academy, and and uh, it didn't take too long for the little letter came back said, "Well, no." <laughs> so uh, sorry. <laughs> so so and and then I was busy with my rockets. So I didn't have any time to mess with it. But it turned out I was not physically qualified for the Air Force Academy anyway because I had really really bad vision, and my mom knew that. So without her telling me, she applied for me to go to Virginia Tech, which was known as mostly as VPI back then, the Virginia Polytechnic Institute, oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, down in Blacksburg. And uh, I, I graduated from high school and won the science fairs and had all my little medals and had that final launch that's the, the last scene in Rocket Boys and also October Sky where my dad and I get together finally and he pushes a button and the rocket flies and it's wonderful. But what happens after that? What happened to this kid after that? He hadn't... He he had no, he had not applied to college. <laughs> he didn't get a scholarship. What's he going to do? And you know that's how the book opens. My mom took over. She's uh, she took care of me even when I wasn't uh, I didn't deserve it, which was most of the time. And she had already applied to Virginia Tech for me. And so uh, so uh, when I finally asked her or told her confessed that I didn't know what I was going to do, she said, "Well, I know what you're going to do. You're going <laughs> to you're going to Virginia Tech." So uh, that's how I ended up down there. That's so funny. And, <laughs> you know, one thing I've noticed that is that a lot of people who are interested in space are also interested in scuba diving. And yeah, a good yeah, thing, huh? Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you know, we talked with, you know, Dr. Catherine Sullivan, who was a shuttle astronaut who became the first woman to go down to the Marianas Trench. Um, and yeah, I know Kathy well. Um, yeah. As a matter of fact, uh, I write about uh, her during the NASA portion of this new book. Uh, she was training, she and Bruce McCandless was training in our big neutral buoyancy simulator that we had um, there at Marshall Space Flight Center, 75 feet across, 40 feet deep, right. huge tank. That Verna Von Braun had, um, he had beat, beaten out the Johnson Space Center. Um, you have to realize that most people don't realize it, but NASA is a, a, a are a series of somewhat related centers that are all encompassed in this National Aeronautics and Space Administration, and we compete with each other. Uh, so Johnson Space Center was called the Man Space Center back then. Was a, a just a creation of Lyndon B. Johnson, who 
for no reason other than the fact that Houston was having some economic problems back in the early 1960s, they put the Manned Space Center, later the Johnson Space Center, there. And they put the astronauts there. And so when you have the astronauts in, a, in an outfit like NASA, you've got a lot of power. So Marshall Space Flight Center up here in Huntsville, we're known for building the rocket system called Rocket City USA for a reason. You know, Saturn V and all that was were, was designed here and, and, and mostly built here. So, uh, but the still the center of power are the astronauts. So you do what you can to get the astronauts where you are. So uh, when we, uh, and this was before my time, but, but uh, by about 10 years when Skylab was being designed, that was our first space station. It was like they wanted the astronauts to go out and work on it, work around it. And how are you going to do that? And 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 some folks figured out if you put a, a suited subject, a s astronaut in, a, in their suit and you weigh them down properly and then you put them underwater, then they can, it's almost like they're in space. And so they can, you can figure out what all your procedures are going to be. So Werner von Braun, who was in charge of the Marshall Space Flight Center at that time, um, uh, asked Congress or through our representatives if we could build a great big, if he could build a great big tank, you know, and Johnson Space Center stood up and said, no, nah, we train the astronauts, you can't do it. And so uh, Dr. von Braun uh, built it anyway and called it uh, a, a, a facility refurbishment. The building <laughs> was already there and they just put this huge tank in there and it's like JSC, I hate you, I hate you people, you know. But anyway, uh, uh, we, had the, we had the big tank. So when I started working for uh, NASA in 1981, I was 38 years old. By then I was a scuba instructor. I'd had a lot of many, many hundreds and thousands of hours underwater uh, diving on shipwrecks and, uh, and that kind of thing. Uh, one of our first, I did a long time around, but I'm getting there. One of our first astronauts that I was there when we trained was Kathy Sullivan uh, and, and Bruce McCandless. They were training on the Hubble Space Telescope right, yep. and not to fix it, but to launch it. And um, uh, as, as, as you probably know, the, it wasn't required for astronauts to go outside to launch um, the Hubble. But if it got stuck in its cradle or something like that, the crew would have to go out and release it manually. So that's what we, that's what we were training on. So Kathy was just, she was wonderful. I mean, um, she had already uh, take, uh, done a real EVA, extra vehicular activity outside. And um, she was just um, a really, really great, great person. And uh, she, looked, she looked after us. We were Marshall Space Flight Center had um, since we were really a bunch of outlaws already, uh, we we didn't have any uh, professional scuba divers, <laughs> so <Sorry to> so <laughs> we basically were all volunteers. Except we got I think you know I don't know twenty five dollars extra a month or something. I don't know. It was pretty. It was pitiful the amount. But so when they would make a test run. Uh, with Kathy or any of the other astronauts, they would call us on the phone in advance, you know, and say, can you make it here? And, you know, can you work in a tank? So the, the great thing about that, uh, James, was that that um, the divers who were working with these astronauts, as utility divers and safety divers and, and, uh, and uh, uh, water safety, all that that were, that were in there working with them were engineers. We were engineers. We were actually, in some cases, the people that were working on the Hubble Space Telescope or the shuttle or the cargo bay. So there was a real advantage to uh, Marshall having, uh, having that tank. And uh, we kept that tank until 1998, just as I retired. Um, and um, they opened up the big, finally JSC got their way and uh, they built that great big neutral buoyancy lab down there. But I, you know, and that's all wonderful. Uh, God bless them. But, um, but they don't have engineer divers like we did. So that's, that, that's, that's the way all that worked out. But yeah, it was great. And you're right. Diving um, is, uh, it's a technical sport. And in the process of, of learning to dive, you learn all, all about the physics of, um, of gases because, you know, you're breathing air. It's 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. So are the astronauts. 
um, except when they're in EVA, then they're breathing pure oxygen at 5%. And what does that do with your blood? And how can they, why do they have to pre-breathe and all that stuff? So you, as divers already know this stuff that a lot of the engineers that get involved with designing some of this stuff don't know. Uh, so yeah, it's a big advantage. That's great. And of course, you know, with your diving, you know, you discovered, you know, <clears throat> shipwrecks and U-boats. And but of course, the <laughs> one adventure of your scuba diving that really caught my attention is you taught David Letterman how to scuba dive. <laughs> <laughs> you would pick what that up, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, the uh, I was actually over in Japan when the when the challenger went down and there's nothing funny about the challenger at all but um the um i was brought back from japan and um uh to work on solid rocket motor redesign because that's what it caused the challenger accident and um which i happen to know a little bit about solid rocket motors actually from my rocket boys days um but um so but i heard that uh, the space camp which is the official name is u.s space and rocket center um, but Space Camp was going to build a little swimming pool to train their their uh, their students in in um, just what we're talking about neutral buoyancy, you know, and, and the procedures in in space and uh, and and uh, microgravity and all that. And I went over and convinced them to build a miniature neutral buoyancy simulator that um, was 30 feet across as versus the 75 uh, mm -hmm. feet across the big one was and and 25 feet deep rather than 40 feet so so we had this little tank and then it was like okay how are you going to train these kids and i came up with this the french were making this llama helmet it was a bubble helmet uh, it was really cool had a, um, a a regulator in the back that you couldn't see and it looked like a real space helmet. It had a little dam there, kind of choked you, but it was like, this is cool. So we're gonna uh, train the kids with this maybe. And, uh, but we had a lot of fun playing with it. And so um, one day I got it, I was sitting there in my office at NASA and I got this call from, from this guy. And, and um, he, he, uh, he said, um, uh, you know, is this Homer Hickam? And I went, yeah. And he said, um, um, so we hear you know something about the llama helmet. And I went, yeah. And he said, uh, I'm with the David Letterman show. And um, we called, uh, we, uh, we want to have an all underwater show with Letterman, with David. He'll be in, he'll be in this helmet, which you know a lot of. By the way, we called France and said uh, to those French people, um, would you come over and teach David Letterman how to, how to, how to work in this helmet? And they went, no. No, who's David Letterman? <laughs> Patui with you. We're French. You know, we're not going to come anywhere. It's like, and by the way, the expert in the llama helmet is Homer Hickam. He's over at Huntsville, Alabama. So, uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, I took it as a big joke. I thought it was somebody that was trying to fool me, you know, and, yeah, um, yeah. and, uh, and I saw this guy by the name Carl Spurlock, who is a local actor. And I said, Carl, is this you? And I said, yeah, no, really, you know, and so, um, so I agreed to, to come up and, um, and I flew up and um, they had a swimming pool uh, in a Red Roof Inn in, uh, in New Jersey. And uh, we had we shipped up a llama helmet. And then once I got into the pool and Letterman showed up, you know, and once I got in the pool with David, I realized he did not know how to scuba dive. <laughs> it's like, uh oh. Yeah, so, all right. So, this is going to so, present a problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You could die in this helmet, right? <laughs> you could actually die, even in a, in a shallow red roof uh in pool in new jersey you could die and it's if you didn't know if you didn't know the rules of scuba diving so it's like okay david i'm going to teach you the same way i teach the kids over at the space camp and and and, and don't mess with me all right <laughs> <laughs> just asking for trouble <laughs> no he really did and uh, he was funny but he was he turned out to be pretty good and um, it was like okay never 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 hold your breath why why is that everybody wants to know it's like okay boils law pressure and volume very inversely i'll tell you real quick but mainly is remember don't hold your breath you know? mm -hmm. so <laughs> so he didn't and um, and then we and then it's it's and I he had a little mask and we went under and breathed uh, i had an extra set of scuba gear and we did that so i put him all through that and then instantly you know within two hours i had two hours to training 
I had put him in this helmet, which is pretty scary. And with the with the dam, it goes around your neck. Yeah. But he did really, really well. And uh, they had a, a, a professional uh, underwater video f- photographer there, and he took he took uh, video of uh, of all that, which was pretty cool. Uh, so 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 uh, years later, uh, when Rocket Boys came out, and then the movie, I was actually on the David Letterman show. And uh, this was like, I say, I taught David, it must have been around 87. And so it was 1999 that I was on Letterman. He, he hadn't forgotten, though. And I hadn't either. And um, I wanted to, uh, Universal Studios wanted me to talk about um, October Sky, of course. And they had this little clip all, all poised and, and queued up, ready to show uh, a, a scene from October Sky. And David, when, uh, you know, he, he, he leaned over and he said, um, would you mind if we didn't show that clip, but showed a clip of you teaching me to work in that llama helmet? <laughs> Which, by the way, they never had the underwater show. It was completely yeah, unrealistic. Uh, it was totally unrealistic. They wanted to uh, film it in the Mystic Aquarium. And I said, and, and the whole idea was they were going to put the set in the Mystic Aquarium and not mention the fact that David was having an underwater show. It's going to be really, really cool. <laughs> and so uh, so David would be in his llama helmet and all his guests would be in a llama helmet and they would just proceed through the whole show as if, as if it was, nothing was having going fish on. swimming by. <laughs> it's like, oh man, you're gonna get, you would definitely get an Emmy out of this. There. There's no question, but I have one. I do have one question for you. What's the water temperature in the Mystic Aquarium? And they said, "Well, it's." We looked that up. And it's 60 degrees. And David, that's fine. David likes likes the, the studio to be really cold. I said, "Okay, 60 deg- degrees." By the time Letterman finishes his monologue, he's going. His teeth are going to be chattering. You realize that. And then by the time he finishes with his first guest, it's probably going to be Terry Gar. Um, he's going to be pretty much unconscious by the end of the show he will be dead because, <laughs> because you can't you can't immerse yourself in 60 degree water for but two hours just you just can't him, <laughs> <laughs> so so that uh, that that ended the show but anyway he did show the clip of me teaching him in the red roof inn there in new jersey and uh I can tell you this much. The Universal Studios people were really, really, really unhappy about that for a couple of reasons. First reason was, of course, they didn't get their movie shown, the movie clip shown. And the second reason was I had been over in Europe during this. And to get back in time for the David Letterman, I convinced these wonderful people of Universal Studios that the only way that I could make it back in time, the only way was to fly the Concorde. Oh, so, so, <laughs> they, <laughs> so but my wife couldn't believe it that I pulled this scam off, and I did, you know. So, uh, so we got to fly the Concorde from from I think that time Paris. I, I pulled that scam on them twice, uh, one time from London and one time from Paris, and they bought it both times. So, uh, so anyway, that's uh, that's the story of Letterman. <laughs> so finally, finally, what's next for you? What's next? And what's coming next in the exciting life of Homer Hagen? Well, um, I'm, I'm out on book tour, of course, for this uh, for this new memoir, Don't Blow Yourself Up. And uh, so that's the, for the foreseeable future till 2022, I guess I'll be out there pushing, uh, pushing this book. Uh, beyond that, uh, of course, I'm an author. I've written like 19 books so far. I'm sure I'll be working on another one. What? I, I really couldn't couldn't tell you at this point. Um, but I'm also on the board at the uh, U.S. Space and Rocket Center Space Camp, and, and that's taking uh, a lot of time, a lot of really good time, um, because uh, we, of course, we've, like everybody else, we've had to work through the COVID uh, and all that, and um, we are, uh, we're book solid, totally book solid, and but we got still got to work around these rules, and, um, and so that takes a little bit of my time, and also we're building a lot of uh, infrastructure over there. Uh, so, uh, to, to me, that's a great, great, great joy. I also go up to Virginia Tech. Um, one of the things I write about and don't blow yourself up is, uh, the fact that while I was there, I did almost blow myself up because I built this big cannon called the Skipper, right. which is now an icon at Virginia Tech. <laughs> uh, so I didn't mean it that way. I just mostly meant it. I wanted to build a cannon because our arch, uh, rival Virginia Military Institute held a little, little pop gun and, 
it's and they and they would fire it and, and yell across the the field. Where is your cannon? Where is your cannon? So uh, a couple of other cadets and I, we ended up building this humongous uh, Civil War style cannon. And when the time came, uh, it was at the annual uh thanksgiving day game we had with vmi uh, in 1963 we dragged that big sucker out and when they fired their little pop gun and said where's your cannon we fired this thing off and it knocked off all their hats on the other side of the field and cracked the <laughs> glass in the in the press box and then we, we started chanting here's our cannon, <laughs> here's our cannon. <laughs> and and we just wanted it for that one time you know but uh somehow uh, the all the uh, students afterwards have uh, taken that on as an icon so uh so yeah i'll be up there uh raising they now have a a crew we, there's only like three of us at the time but now they've got like 20 cadets to take care of this thing and so um they always need a little bit of extra change and uh you know for their for their rounds and 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 their uniforms, special uniforms and all that. So I'm gonna I'll probably go up there a little bit and keep raising money for them and talking about the skipper. And uh, so yeah, there's plenty in my life I've got yet to do. I hope <laughs> that's great. I just want to throw this idea out there for 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 your thoughts: a book release event held completely underwater. Oh wow! Yeah, <laughs> uh, that's not that's not Shouldn't be any problems with that, right? That's that's not an entirely bad idea. I have to test it, of course, which would drive my uh, my wife crazy. Well, because she has a little bookstore, so I'd have to take one of her book. I'd have to pay her for it. Right. Take one of my books and put it in the bathtub <laughs> just to see if it would hold together. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, right. uh, thank you, James, for that idea. I will follow immediately up on it, uh, right. guaranteed. <laughs> so much fun talking with you, Homer. Thanks for being on the show. Really. Oh, my pleasure. It. My pleasure. And love to have you on anytime. <laughs> and uh, that was Homer Hickam. He's the author of Rocket Boys, the young man at the center of the movie October Sky. Go check out his new book coming up 19th of October. Don't blow yourself up. And Homer, don't blow yourself up. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Visit with us each week on Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion as we bring the cosmos down to Earth and scientists directly into your homes and onto your phones with fun and informative interviews. Next week, we welcome Dr. Jenna Milliard, a science journalist and co-presenter of the Awesome Astronomy podcast to the show, talking about amateur astronomy and bringing science to the masses. We're also going to talk with Dr. Erkan Elp of Argonne National Laboratory. He is one of the very few people to have ever seen samples from the asteroid Ryugu, and he has a big x-ray gun. Make sure to join us starting on the 19th of October. Subscribe to our VIP newsletter to see every episode of this show one day early, together with advanced viewings of our comics, jokes, and a whole lot more. We depend on support from viewers just like you. For ways to help support this program, including VIP subscriptions, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net forward slash support. Please stay safe, stay healthy, and keep your wonder alive. If you enjoyed this episode of Astronomy News with the Cosmic Companion, and I sure hope you did, please download and share the episode on YouTube, Facebook video, or your favorite podcast provider. Remember, you can watch every episode of this show at thecosmiccompanion.tv. For more details on space and astronomy news, please visit thecosmiccompanion.com or thecosmiccompanion.net.